So it's my pleasure to get to introduce to you uh, Ben Larson. He is a dear brother in Christ. Uh, he's also a member of Christ Community Baptist Church in Puyallup, Washington. I know it's over on the other side, but don't hold that against him. <laughs> he, his heart is definitely an east side heart. Okay, so uh, the best part, he says the best part of uh, him is his wife, Alyssa. They have three children and a fourth due in late June. Uh, he has recently stepped down as youth director uh, in that church to prayerfully seek what God has in future for him and his family. And so we're honored to present, and he is so honored to present the word. So Ben, please bring what the Lord has laid on your heart. All right, good morning, everybody. Well, it is a great honor to get to come here and uh, present God's Word this morning. It's going to be from Psalm 22. Um, the more that I get to know people outside of my community that maybe I didn't grow up with or haven't known for very long, it's such a blessing to be one in God's Spirit with His children. And I'm consistently blessed by getting to know some of you here at this church and um, it's just a, a huge blessing. So thank you for allowing me to come this morning and present God's word. It is an amazing, beautifully prophetic psalm in Psalm 22 and I'm honored and very excited to present it to you this morning. We get to go um, back to David and as he, as he's writing this psalm, it's one, a prayer and a lament and a praise from David, but it's also prophecy from God of Christ. So we're going to look at both aspects of that today. It was written a thousand years before Christ. And just a little bit of a perspective this morning. Uh, 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed across the ocean and started this European colonization of the United States and just shy of 300 years from that time um, we have Independence Day in 1776. So we got log cabins, horse-drawn carriages, no equipment or machinery and today in 2021 look at all that is in America. Airplanes and I mean all these equipment out here in the fields you see I'm always fascinated by those but a thousand years is a long time that's only about 500 years. So we get to see God's prophecy a thousand years after it was spoken. This psalm was penned by the hand of David and breathed out by the spirit of the living God. And we know David was a king of Israel, yes, but he was also a prophet of God, as Acts tells us in chapter 2, 29 through 31. So again, we get to walk through both aspects, David's lament, prayer, and praise, and God's prophecy. So would you, would you pray with me this morning before we dive into God's Word? Lord, we come. We come to learn of you. We come to grow of you. And we ask that you would speak to your broken servant, God, that your Word would come forth, that you would lay aside all distractions, all things of yesterday, all things of this morning, God, that you would teach us, you would pierce our hearts with your word, and we would walk away knowing and seeing you in a greater light of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I was supposed to move this when I started. So please stand as we read Psalm 22. We're going to start with verse 1, and we're going to go through verse 21. For starters, and then you can be seated after that, and we'll kind of work through the rest of this scripture. So Psalm 22, 1 through 21, again, this is starting with the prayer and lament of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Verse 6, But I am a worm and not a man, 
scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make malice at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. And there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. 16. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Like I said, we're going to start there. You guys can be seated if you like. So this is the this is the portion of David's prayer and lament. And we're going to start back to verse 1 now. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David is clearly distraught. He's crying out to God, but he is feeling no answer. It doesn't feel like God is answering him. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever been in a time in your life where you feel like you're crying out to God in your despair and you don't feel an answer? But let us notice this today. As David continues in verse 3 through 5, he knows, he knows, and restates God's faithfulness to his people. Look at verse 3. Yet you are holy. After he just said, gets done saying, I cry out to you, but you don't answer. Yet you are holy, verse 3, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. Yes, he's feeling distraught and feeling unanswered by God, yet he's anchoring and reiterating to himself, if no one else, that God does answer and does deliver. Verses 6 through 8, David states how man views him, how people treat him and mock him. But I am a worm and not a man, verse 6. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. You ever feel despised by people? (laughs) Verse 7. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. And mockingly, that's why this is in quote marks, they say, He trusts in the Lord. Let Him deliver Him. Let Him rescue Him, for He delights in Him. Ever have people putting you down? Look down on you? treat you poorly. Notice again how David follows this description of his situation. All these people, everyone who sees him mocks him. Yet, verse 9, you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Again, he affirms who God is, what he's done. I can't help but think of Romans 8.31. It says this, What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? God has saved His children, redeemed them from hell, and called them His own. So what if people shake their head? Verse 11 through 18. We see in verse 11, David cries, David says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. And 12 through 18, he goes through this situation that seems so hopeless. Follow me, verse, verse 12. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. 
We're going to talk more about this later too, but, but picture, think of that. What, what does that look like? I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. A pot shirt is a piece of clay. Oftentimes they'll, they'll dig them out in archaeological digs and whatnot. It's really dry. Really dry, right? Which you guys understand dry over here on this side. <laughs> more, than, more than me, maybe. <laughs> if we dig up clay on that side, it's still wet and muddy, you know? This is not speaking of something still wet and moldable. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Not a good situation. David feels like he's walking through. But notice this difference as we go through 19 to 21. Again, he affirms, But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help. Come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Now pay attention here in verse 21. Save me from the mouth of the lion. Up to this point, David's crying out for God to save him. And look at the difference here. After that exclamation point, to that capital Y, something changed. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Now let's read through verse 22 to 26. Now what, look, look at the, you see the change here? 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him. Stand in awe of Him. All you offspring of Israel, for He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Look at that affirmation there. He heard. He heard. 25. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. A lot different than how that psalm started out. I know we didn't get to the end yet. We're getting there. But look at how David looked back to the faithfulness of God in his despair while he was suffering. He cried out to God. God took his troubles, fears, or David took his troubles, fears, and heartaches to God. And look how God delivered him. And we see that resulting in praise and glory to God from David. Now, does God always deliver from pain? or suffering, or heartache, or, or grief from other people. This side of heaven, no. I mean, we die this side of heaven, right? Like, like bad things happen this side of heaven. But for the Christian, God is our deliverer. The punishment for our sin, damnation in hell, God has delivered us from that. So come what may, right? But a breath in this life. I'm going to give you a truth from this, from this section before we move on. God is trustworthy and faithful to His children. And we see three applications here also. There's more, but I'm going to pull out three here. Look and dwell on God's deliverance of His people in history, in His story. That's what David did. He looked back and said, God, You have delivered our fathers. We can count on our God. You know, the Israelites, when they were coming from slavery in Egypt, as they're coming to the Promised Land, they would set up these stone monuments. You remember those? And every time they set up a stone monument, it was for looking back to how God delivered them. When the next generation would ask, they could point and talk about, yes, God delivered us here. He parted the sea here. He took us from Egypt here. It was to tell of God's deliverance to the next generation. So look and dwell on those things. Application 2. Look at how He has delivered you in your life. If you are a child of God, a born again believer, God has delivered you from hell after this. There is nothing to fear. We were just talking about this on the way here. The Bible says, don't fear man, but fear Him who can condemn you to hell. And we, and we as children of God recognize that and we have been born by the Spirit 
Not, of, not just of blood, right? Okay, so look at how He's delivered you in your life. Even if you're still walking through some hardship, God's delivered you eternally. Thirdly, focus on Him and His trustworthiness in the heat of the struggle. And we see David model that as he's going through these things, he still would come back to, yet you chose me from my mother's womb. Yet you've delivered our forefathers. Yet you are holy. You with me? All right, now we're going to see another angle in the purpose of this psalm. Something you may or may have not noticed. All through this psalm, God is prophesying Christ crucified. We see this in the opening verse of this psalm. It is yelled from the mouth of our Lord as He hung on the cross. And we're going to have a lot of scriptures coming up here. Most of them are on the slide, so you can follow along there or feel free to turn there too. But Matthew 27, 46 says this, About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now it would be healthy here, to refer to another passage of Scripture. Our minds can run far with this statement. We can think Jesus is confused. Or He's not sure what God is doing. And that can kind of warp our perception of what the triune God is. What He is as all-knowing, omnipotent, right? Omniscient. Because Scripture is infallible, God's holy word is perfect. Because it is certain when we get to a confusing verse or a passage that might lead us to a different thought than what we've believed or come to know, we must interpret it in light of what is unmistakable in Scripture. I'm going to say that again. When we get to a confusing verse or passage that is difficult to understand with certainty, we must interpret it in light of what is unmistakable in Scriptures. Colossians 1, 15-17, speaking of Jesus Christ, says this, Colossians 1, 15-17, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So why would Jesus be saying this? Why would He be crying this out? He can't be confused. He's God. He can't be surprised. He's God. At the same time, for the first time in forever, Christ is experiencing the wrath of God for all of His children's sin. From all of history past, all the way to the end of the future. Now, I don't see in Scripture where it clarifies what Christ's mind, where Christ's mind is here. However, what we can see is this, and I invite you to walk through this with me. The Bible didn't have chapters and verses back then. When people would go and read a psalm or, or a piece of Scripture from the Torah or something, they would read it from a scroll, and they would memorize key phrases and key parts of it. And oftentimes, that's where it would start. So when Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every scripture-knowing person on that scene, every Jew, every devout Jew that would memorize tons of scripture, went right to Psalm 22. Also, as we read the account of the Gospels of Jesus Christ, we're taken right back to Psalm 22 when we read that Jesus said this. These men that God used to kill His Son for the forgiveness of sin for us should have been immediately reminded of this psalm. So look with me, if you will, again. Back to verse 7. It says this, All who see me mock me. They make malice at me and they wag their heads. And look what Matthew 27, 39 says, And those passing by were hurling abuse at Him, wagging their heads. You guys ever have somebody shake their head at you? I had the privilege of getting to go through an apprenticeship and I got my head wagged at me a lot. <laughs> it's not cool, right? Not, and you get offended, you get upset. This is the God of the universe and His creation is walking by Him as He's dying for them. 
And they're wagging their heads at him. And he doesn't smite them on the scene. And the mocking continues. Look at verse 8 in Psalm 22. Commit yourself to the Lord. I have to apologize here. I did some of this sermon prep with NASB. And it says commit yourself to the Lord here. Where ESV says, uh, it says, he trusts in the Lord. So my apologies. But bear with me. Verse 8 says, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. And look what Matthew 27, 43 says. The mocking continues. The head shakers threw insults. They said, He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, for he said, I'm the Son of God. So we see that mocking foreshadowed by this psalm. Verse 12 through 13. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. Now we know that the Jews and the Roman soldiers would have been a, a big emphasis of strength in that day. We know that Pilate was afraid of the Jewish mob that was coming to him. That's why he was so worried about how he handled Jesus because he didn't want to upset this mob of people, right? So this would have been strength in numbers and strength in people. But think of the spiritual aspect of Christ on the tree. I'm going to read this again as you're thinking of that. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I imagine that Satan and his demons are having quite a festival at this scene of Jesus hanging on the tree of the Creator of all. All things were made by Him and through Him. Imagine the force of Satan and his demons. Now listen to this from Dr. John MacArthur. Bashan is an interesting term. Bashan was an area of the finest pasture land in that part of the world. And the land of Bashan grew for the finest, sorry, grew the biggest bulls because it was the best pasture. It was also a solitary pasture land where there was no domestication of the bulls. Now listen, as, as David, God, speaks through David, using these bulls, shadowing Christ's crucifixion. Listen to what this says. And so the bulls of Bashan were large. There were no domestication of the bulls. They were totally wild. The Canaanites believed that the bulls of Bashan were possessed with bull spirits, and that the kingdom of Bashan was literally operating or functioning from these bull-like spirits who entered and possessed people. So there was an occultic, demonic history of the Canaanite of the Canaanitish religion relative to these bulls of Bashan. And so I think, again, this is the words of Dr. John MacArthur, I think what our Lord is seeing is far more than just an angry crowd, far more than just babbling human beings. I think our Lord is well sensing the closing in of the forces of hell as they do everything they can to put Him out of existence. And I, I, I imagine that is very true. Now make no mistake, this devil and his demons is still here in this place. I don't mean not here now. I mean on this earth, right? The de- a brother of mine says the devil's real and he has real teeth and they're sharp. Like he is an enemy. We have an enemy. He comes to steal and kill and destroy and he is powerful. By no means does he match the power of our Lord. We praise God for that. But he is strong and he is powerful and he would like nothing more than to rip this church apart than to rip your marriage apart than to rip your children and your family apart. He would love nothing more than that. So as we walk into situations and circumstances in our life, know that it is not just a coincidence that things are happening. It's not just rebellion. It's not just a, a, a fallenness of our nature. There is a spiritual war that we are engaged in every moment. And our God has given us a spirit, not of fear, but of power. Amen. All right, so that was verse 12 through 13. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. Listen to what John 19, 34 says, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. 
And, and God is prophesying, but, but I am poured out like water. Not only that, but as he was beaten and whipped with his cat of nine tails, he would have been po- bleeding so much, it would have been like water. Verse 14 continues, All of my bones are out of joint. In the process of the crucifixion, the wrists, elbows, and shoulders would have been pulled out of socket as the person hangs on that cross, ripping, pulling, his muscles and, and his rib cage up and out, suffocating himself, right? But also all of his bones would have been out of joint, and that's what this verse 14 speaks to. Causing the maximum pain as he would go to press down on his feet that had a nail through them would have been excruciating, adding to this suffering. Our Lord did for us. Verse 14b through 15. My heart is like wax. It is welted, melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. You lay me in the dust of death. This speaks to the unimaginable dehydration Christ experienced. I can't imagine. Now, I, I drive somewhere for an hour. And I'm like, ah, I forgot my water jug, man. I'm thirsty. I have no idea what this dehydration must have felt like. John 19, 28 says this. After this, Jesus, knowing, all, knowing that all was now finished, said, parentheses, to fulfill scripture, I thirst. <laughs> what an understatement. Verse 16, they have pierced my hands and my feet. 1,000 years before Christ, God is speaking this onto paper through David's pen. And he says, they have pierced my hands and feet. Crucifixion wasn't even a thing then. Man didn't invent this gruesome death yet. Verse 17, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. As Jesus was hanging on this tree again, joints ripped out of socket, rib cage up and out, his flogged, beaten, ripped apart flesh. I imagine they, you may have seen the white of his bones as he's running out of blood. Not only that, if, if you were naked, you would see your ribs. You would be able to count all these bones. You would probably see a separation in his shoulder and in his elbow. You would count. You'd be able to count all of them. They stare and gloat over me. Verse 18 says this, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Matthew 27, 35, this rings true. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. Something I never had thought about. This must have cut deep. In the Old Testament, we see that when a man is given a, in a pledge or, or a promise or security for somebody and they, and they gave their coat as an oath, they were to return that outer garment before nightfall because this was this man's bed. This is what people slept in, right? So this was a pretty important piece of clothing, especially for a poor carpenter. And the scripture says, a son of man who had no place to lay his head. Now normally, this article of clothing, when this person would pass away, would be given to the mother or a brother or a close relative, right? And here we see this indignation, this carelessness of these people rolling dice for who gets the sovereign king of the universe's outer garment. As his mother's there, I don't know if it's actually dice they rolled, but, you know, they cast lots. It was a thing, a thing they did. Now, here's where my imagination goes to. Anybody got an important piece of clothing they were given from somebody? From a family member or something? Me and you. Just me and you today. Oh, okay. Back there too. <laughs> so, 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 I imagine this being an important piece of clothing may have been gifted to him by somebody. Maybe even his mother. This is my imagination going, okay? Movie mode. But I imagine this was of significant value, not only in that culture, but to Christ himself. And from his mother, maybe. Not only is she watching as he hangs on the tree, but she's watching as this garment is gambled away by these evil men. Again, that's my imagination there, okay? So bear with me. Verse 6, But I am a worm and not a man. Now this word here used for worm is not speaking of maggot, as Scripture does elsewhere. 
This word is referencing a very specific type of worm. The crimson or scarlet worm. Not a worm like an earthworm as we know. When I think of a worm, I think of an earthworm. I always thought that Jesus was describing himself as a worm or, or, or David is describing himself as a worm because he's lower than the ground. You know, he feels worthless. But it's much more than that. The Hebrew word for this worm is tolah. And you can look it up in Strong's if you do that. The number is 8438. But they actually use this worm and the red wax inside its body as a key source of crimson or scarlet dye in biblical times. My neighbor and sister in Christ showed me this, uh, this parallel of, of the gospel here, and I'm going to walk you through it. This is something that discovercreation.com said about this crimson worm or scarlet worm or toloth. The crimson worm or coccus illicis is a very special worm that looks more like a grub than a worm. Or like kind of, to me, it looks like a potato bug. I've never seen one in real life. It looks like a little red potato bug. Or roly-poly, if you know them better by that. <laughs> it's a very special worm that looks more like a grub than a worm. When it is time for the female or mother crimson worm to have babies, which she does only one time in her life. Okay, so when she, she only has babies one time in her life. I brought some scripture to this. So we can see the shadowing of the gospel here. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also died for sins once for all. So this female worm has children one time. Christ died for sins one time. Okay? When that time comes for the worm to, give her, to have her offspring, she finds a trunk of a tree, a wooden fence post, or a stick. She then attaches her body to the... Oh, where'd it go? She then attaches her body to that wood and makes a hard crimson shell. She is so strongly and permanently stuck to the wood that the shell can never be removed without tearing her body completely apart and killing her. This mother worm was born to die in this way, to, to, to give birth in this way and to die in this way. Isaiah 50 verse 7 is another prophetic scripture of the cross and it speaks of Christ fixing his face like flint. He was born to hang on that tree, to die on the cross, just like this worm was born to die in this way. Now, after the crimson worm fixes herself to the wood, she then lays her eggs under her body and the protective shell. When the baby worms hatch, they stay under the shell. Matthew 23, 37, Christ Jesus speaks of wanting to gather Israelite children together as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Not only does a mother's body give protection for her babies, but it also provides them with food. You still with me here on this worm? Listen to this. The babies feed on the living body of the mother. John 6.53 says this. Jesus says, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in yourselves. Matthew 4.4 4 also says this, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You guys seeing this parallel here with this worm that God made? After just a few days, when the young worms grow to the point that they are able to take care of themselves, the mother dies. As the mother crimson worm dies, she oozes a crimson or scarlet red Die, which not only stains the wood she's attached to, but stains her children. Hmm. They are colored scarlet red for the rest of their lives, from the death of their mother. Just like Christ's blood covers over us, His blood marks His children. We carry His name everywhere we go. We carry His image to the world. We are stained through the beautiful blood sacrifice of Christ. If that wasn't enough for this worm, after three days, it comes back to life. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what? <laughs> after three days, <laughs> the dead mother crimson worm's body loses its crimson color and turns white. Like a white wax which falls to the ground like snow. And it just so happens that we see the parallel in Christ's resurrection, obviously, the three days. But we read in Isaiah 118, God says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like 
wool. All through this worm's life, it was stained red till it died and it turned white. Then we see we are stained with our sin until Christ enters in and washes us and makes us clean. And we're imputed with His righteousness. Yes, we still sin, but we're forgiven. Praise God. How beautiful is this? Now the focus here obviously isn't this little creature that God made. It's this great creator that from the beginning, Genesis 1.24 says, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. Cattle and creeping things. From that moment, God made this worm. He put it in the heart and mouth and pen of David and put it in our Savior's mouth as he pointed back to Psalm 22. So we see from the beginning, since day one, God has had His plan of deliverance and redemption for His people. It's been in action, and we now stand in the accomplished will of our Lord. In faith, in Christ's blood. Now in summary, we can see God divinely orchestrating His will since the beginning of creation. We see His prophecy a thousand years ahead of time ring true. And the most awe-inspiring, glory-reaping display of our King. We see our Savior point back to this scripture, clearly being fulfilled in His crucifixion, and we see His deliverance of His people when all seemed lost to the human perspective. Now we left off in verse 27. I want you to follow along and listen carefully to the rest of this psalm. Verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and He rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before Him shall bow. All who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve Him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim His righteousness to a people yet unborn, that He has done it. Amen. Hallelujah. Look back to verse 30. I woke up one morning, and the Holy Spirit had just exploded posterity this word posterity into my mind and I hadn't looked it up. I didn't know what it was. I'm like, well, I'm not going to unpack every little word, but listen to what posterity means. I looked it up, okay? The offspring of one progenitor. I had to look up what progenitor means. Forefather. So this word posterity, when it says posterity shall serve him, means the offspring of one forefather to the furthest generation. That's a cool word, Right? The offspring, so when we read verse 30, the offspring of one forefather to the furthest, furthest generation shall serve him. That's us. We are the offspring of one forefather to the furthest generation. And it's still going. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come. Who shall come? The offspring of that forefather to the furthest generation shall come. What will they do? They will proclaim His righteousness to a people yet unborn that He has done it. When Christ finished this death on that tree, He said it is finished. He has done it. This prophecy, our deliverance, the defeat of death is finished. Here's some applications. Application one, repent from your sin. Turn away from it. Place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Proclamation, tell of the Lord to the coming generation. He has done it. Praise God. Sometimes that's, a, that's an application we forget. To, to walk in praise of God. To worship. To stand in awe of Him. Remember and turn to the Lord over and over in life. You're going to come to things where you're smacking a wall. And you're like, God, I don't know what to do here. Turn to Him. Let Him be your strength. Look back again like we saw the, some of the first applications to how God has delivered. Hang on those things. Ponder these things in your heart like Mary did. Ponder who God is in your heart. Learn more of Him. Dive into more of Him. 
Would you pray with me one more time, please? Lord, we stand in awe of who you are, God. As we think of 500 years ago, God, my mind is hard to wrap around a thousand years ago. Yet from the beginning of time, you had ordained to save a people for your name. And you've done it, God. And we pray, we ask that anyone who hears this message, God, that hears your word, that you would call into new life through your blood. God, we ask that as we are stained, as we carry your image to the world, that we would be bold. God, that you would give us strength. That we would proclaim that you have done it to the people lost and dead and trapped in their sin. God, as the bulls of Bashan close in among your people, that you would show them the light of your strength. God, that you would be our rock, our deliverer. We love you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.